Good evening, ghoulies and ghosties and long-leggedy beasties. This is Alex, coming at you from the underworld, and welcome back to another episode of... Well, fall is finally here, and for that reason, I'm going to review a book this weekend that is suitable to the cooler months. But before I get into that, I just really want to say I wish I had more time to review more than one book a week. Like, if I had the opportunity, I would review two or three books a week and totally be in heaven. But, of course, time is a factor. And the reason I'm thinking about this now is because I really wanted to do a themed lineup for September that just didn't happen. And this is the second time I've been faced with this problem. Like, the first time I wanted to do a themed lineup that I didn't have the opportunity to actually do was during the summer when I wanted to read and review some demonic-themed horror books and do a lineup called the Hotter Than Hell lineup. But, of course, that didn't happen. And I wanted to read and review some occult-themed and witchcraft-themed horror books before October got here, but lo and behold, October starts next weekend, so it's going to be time to focus on Halloween. And even though I will be focusing on titles that are Halloween-related, some of those are kind of occult-related, but they are not hardcore occult-related like the books were that I wanted to read and review. However, I am very grateful that we at least have this weekend because it gave me the opportunity to review Harvest Home by Thomas Tyron. And this is one of my favorite books. Like, I've read it two or three times by now. And when I decided to revisit it again, I talked with my good friend Tiny and was like, well, I'm about to read this book. I know that you've enjoyed it before. Do you want to do a buddy read? And of course she said yes. So this gave us the opportunity to talk about the characters and have some good discussions and kind of talk about the philosophies in this as well. Plus, we were able to fanboy and fangirl out over how awesome of an author Thomas Tyron was. So... I know I'm running my mouth here, and y'all need to learn to tell me to shut the hell up and get down to the book when I do this. So what I'm going to do is I'm just going to grab you by the hand, and we're going to go on down to Cornwall Coombe, and we're going to make us some corn. Before I talk about Harvest Home, I want to share how awesome of a book cover it had back in the 70s. Look at that. And, of course, to see this in its full glory, you have to take the cover off of the book so you can fold it out. But I really wish that we could go back to having book covers like this where it's just really grim and beautiful at the same time. But what we have today are book covers that really feel like they're watered down and generic. And there's actually been a few times where I thought a book was a romance or a drama because of the watered down book cover. So I really wish we could get back to this, but I think that this is just a product of its time and it's something that we probably won't see again. But I did want to share this so you could just see the beauty of its originality. Harvest Home by Thomas Tyron opens up introducing the narrator by the name of Ned Constantine, and he explains early on that he and his family had relocated to the quaint New England village of Cornwall Coombe, which the reason why is because they had been living in New York, and he and his wife felt like it was too dangerous of a place to raise a child. So they relocated to a smaller area hoping for a simple kind of life. Well, once they get settled in, Ned starts to realize that the villagers here still go by some ancient customs and beliefs. One of those customs is actually a fertility festival by the name of Harvest Home. And for any outsider, they think that this is just some good old-fashioned folk celebration. However, every seven years, this celebration requires a blood sacrifice. And the more Ned starts to realize he might be in trouble, he discovers that he and his family were deliberately allowed into Cornwall Coombe because this year, they're going to play a vital role in Harvest Home. Harvest Home was published in 1973, which was two years after Tyron published his game-changing debut horror novel, The Other. And with the profits Tyron earned from The Other, he received $625,000 for the paperback rights to Harvest Home before its hardcover publication. 
And while Harvest Home is a folk-themed horror novel that focuses on occult practices surrounding corn, this concept predated Stephen King's Children of the Corn by four years. In 1978, Harvest Home was adapted into the TV miniseries The Dark Secret of Harvest Home. This adaptation starred Betty Davis, who said she wanted to play the Widow Fortune ever since the book was released. Although reviews were mixed regarding the publication of Harvest Home, it has become a cult classic. Fun facts! With Harvest Home, Thomas Tyron mentions the goddess Demeter, and if you're unfamiliar with her mythology, you're probably not going to catch the Easter eggs that the author has laid out for you. So, for this reason, I'm going to use this segment to explain a little bit more about Demeter. For Harvest Home, it makes sense Tyron would choose Demeter as the Coombs goddess of worship. After all, Demeter is known as the Harvest Goddess, and she rules over grains and making earth fertile. Also, she was known as the Cycle of Life and Death, and she was sometimes called the Goddess of Sacred Law. Among her many attributes, she revealed to humankind how to grow and use corn. In the past, art has shown her wearing a wreath made of corn ears. Upon celebrating Demeter, her largest festival came at harvest, and for the festival of Thesmophoria, which was a fertility festival, only women were allowed to attend. Now that we have that covered, it's time to move on to the spoiler section of this video, which, if you've never read this book before, I'm going to discuss some things that could ruin the experience for you. So if you wish to skip this section, just scroll down to the comments and you'll see that I have a pinned comment at the top where there's a timestamp within it, and if you were to click this timestamp, it will redirect you from this section to the Thoughts chapter. Now, you only have 17 seconds to do this, so ready, set, go! Since everyone has had the opportunity to click away, I would like to talk about two scenes that were really nightmarish, and I would like to elaborate on how creepy the ending of this book was. But the first moment I want to bring into the light is when Ned encounters Gracie Everdeen's ghost. And what happens here is the author really presents to the reader that something creepy is going to happen, and he does this with scenery because he says that this is a fall evening with a full moon, so there's all of the ingredients we need for something creepy to show up. And what happens is Ned ends up crossing the Lost Whistle Bridge and goes into the section of woods where Gracie Everdeen's ghost is supposed to haunt because that's where she killed herself. Well, lo and behold, he looks up and sees her spirit floating 12 feet overhead. And instead of her just being described as a ghost, the author goes an extra mile here and says that she's this haggard looking thing that has liquid coming out of its mouth. And because of the backstory that surrounds her, I really was afraid for Ned because I thought she was going to hurt him. However, the moment when she actually disappeared without hurting him, I was like, okay, well, she was a sign of warning that Ned needed to get the hell out of Cornwall Coombe. So that was pretty cool. And the second moment that really stood out to me was the moment when Ned gets roofied. And what happens here is prior to this moment, you see where Ned and Beth are wanting to conceive another child, but they're not able to. And when the Widow Fortune hears about this, she decides to lend them a helping hand. Well, what happens is she ends up giving them a cask of mead that she had spiked with mushrooms. And so Ned is drinking the mead and everything, and Ned and his wife end up going outside. It's kind of late in the evening, and they're relaxing. They're kind of getting into the mood and stuff, which this is when they start to hear, like, some flutes playing in the cornfield, and also some tambourines are playing as well. And... If that's not unsettling enough, there's this big tall man that steps out of the cornfield, which because of Ned is tripping at this point, he thinks that this is like the Jolly Green Giant. But I'm like thinking, okay, well, by how this character is described and how pegnostic this book is, I really think that might be the Green Man. I mean, there's really no proof on it, but that's just where my mind went in regards to that character. 
And even though this would kill the moment for anyone else, Ned and Beth go inside and have sex. So everything about this really just feels like a fever dream. It really reminded me of the date rape sequence in Rosemary's Baby. And the fantastic imagery here goes a step further because Ned really imagines the flutes being like the pipes of Pan. And he imagines that there's satyrs out in the cornfield dancing and having a jolly good time while he and his wife are doing the hibbity dibbity. So that was really interesting. And... The ending of this book, my god, it was something that was just so damn creepy because the thing is, at the beginning of the book, we have no idea that Ned has been disfigured in any way. We think that he's just simply okay and just making do with what he has. Well, at the end of the book, we discovered that because of him seeing the ritual he wasn't supposed to see, the women of Cornwall Coombe blind him, and they also cut out his tongue. So they've made him to the point where he has to submit to their area, and he cannot tell anyone what's happened, and he cannot see anything else. And because of how he's treated, we also understand this is not the first time someone has been done this way, because we have the character of Robert Dodd, who is also blind, and even though it's never said that Robert Dodd had seen what went down, we can connect the dots here. And to me, this is very unnerving, because not only does it show that they've done this before, it shows that they will do it again and again, and their bloody customs will continue for generations to come. Y'all, I could use this opportunity to bitch about how Tamar Penrose ain't nothing but a cold-hearted homewrecker who needs to be followed around with a bucket and a mop, but I would really like to focus on Justin Hook, who is the Harvest Lord, and truth be it, everyone in the village knows that he has a prize rooster, and girl, I ain't talking about poultry here. But even the Widow Fortune knows what Justin is packing down there. And come to think about it, that's a little creepy because she's like the age of Methuselah or whatnot. But I have no right to judge because if I lived there, my fat gay ass would be just huddled up to the Widow Fortune and would be sipping us some shroom mead and making a quilt and would be talking about how Justin was a human tripod. And truth be it... If this story took place in modern time and the village did actually embrace, like, technology and everything, I could honestly see Justin being pretty popular on Pornhub. Although I really did enjoy Harvest Home, I tend to think some readers might feel a little differently because the book is very tropish. Which, what I mean by that is, the subject has been done before. And this is the subject where you see a family move from a larger city to a smaller village with the intent to leave behind crime and go to a safe haven. Which, of course, once they do this, they discover they've gone from bad to worse. And even though the subject has been done before, I still appreciate it because it reminds the reader that sometimes the grass isn't as green as what it appears on the other side. Now, as far as themes go, I noticed quite a few different themes in this book, which the first one was the book is very sexual, and I don't just mean that by people having sex, I mean that in general, because we have the fertility festival, then there's the making of the corn, then we also have the comparison between Mother Earth and the human female, which that comparison is, if you seed Mother Earth, then she will produce, much like the human female. Also, another subject I noticed was how it's important to have an education, because the people in Cornwall Coombe don't even have a school. Which, because of this, a lot of the villagers are really ignorant. Lord, like this one poor man, he thinks that spaghetti grows out of the ground and you can harvest it. And I tend to think to myself that if there was a school there, he might would feel differently, but who knows? And aside from that, we see another subject that comes into play where it really urges people to go beyond where they've grown up and to just venture out into the world. Because with Cornwall Coombe, people really don't leave there and they really don't accept strangers in from the outside world. So for this reason, 
a lot of the villagers have participated in incest. And, of course, I don't think I really need to elaborate on that subject because nothing good can come from incest. So, anywho, on to the next subject. I noticed where the book also focuses on the idea that you really should embrace change because a lot of times change is good, which this comes into play because the character Worthy comes into town with his tractor. And you see where the villagers look at him and the tractor like it's just Satan himself. Which, even though this piece of machinery can make the workday easier, the villagers prefer to have the long, strenuous workday prior to actually using modern technology. And even though this seems petty in regards to the farming sense, it actually goes a lot deeper than what it appears because we see that it brings on a judgmental mindset and it shows where, as the world is advancing, you just get left behind. So that was really interesting. Then I also noticed some philosophy in the book, which this comes about because the Widow Fortune is speaking to Ned, and she says, yeah, God is good, God created man, and all that stuff. But she also says that God created Mother Earth first, and man was made from Mother Earth. So perhaps we are not giving Mother Earth the credit she deserves. So those aren't her words exactly, but in a nutshell. And I can imagine that this concept would really bring on a lot of different debates, which I find to be very interesting, and I was happy to see it in a horror book. Now, as far as characters go, I really did enjoy the characters here because they really seemed like they were realistic. The amount of development that the author put into them actually felt like someone who might live next door or the next town over. So that was really cool. And at the end of the day, the book didn't scare me, but there were some scenes that did creep me out, and I was held in suspense. But I just really didn't feel like this was the kind of book where I would need to sleep with the lights on. Harvest Home is a great example of American Gothic horror with some great folkloric roots. And if you're a fan of movies like The Wicker Man or Midsummer, which I was a huge fan of both, then this book is totally going to be for you. And since I've already mentioned that I enjoy this book and it's among my top favorites, then heck yeah, I highly recommend you read this, especially for the fall season. So, I made a little screw up and... What ha happened was, I realized for the last two videos, I've been saying Thomas Tyron, and it's actually Thomas Tryon. So if you go to a bookstore to ask for The Other or Harvest Home, be sure to ask for Thomas Tryon versus Thomas Tyron. So I'm sorry about that. Hopefully you can forgive me, and I will be more aware in the near future. But with that said, let's get down to having some fun because I decided to do something new this last week, which I normally post an image from my upcoming video and I tell people to meme it or leave a caption on it. And I decided that for those who are doing this, I'm going to start giving a shout out to the person who left the best caption. So without further ado, let's see which caption was my favorite. So this week, the caption that did it for me is from Diana Kelly from Facebook, and she says, Well, I do declare, if common sense was lard, most people wouldn't be able to grease a pan. Well, I hope everyone enjoyed my first caption segment because it will happen again, and I want everybody to know that I really did enjoy the captions that you put with that photo, no matter if it was through Facebook, Twitter, or Instagram, and it was really hard just to narrow it down, but that was the caption that really made me laugh. So, with that said, let's go on and get over to the questions, which the first question I have is, what is a horror book you would recommend that has a witch in it? load up the comments. My second question is, have you ever had a peculiar encounter with a witch? Personally, I have, and it's kind of funny because I'm like, this would only happen to me, but I was at a stoplight one time, and I was rear-ended by this black Volvo, and before I could even react, the lady who was driving the Volvo had gotten out, ran up to my window, and the very first words out of her mouth were, Oh my goddess, are you okay? So that should have really been a clue there. Also, she was all decked out in black, and plus she had on a pinnacle necklace, 
So I'm like, wow, okay. I got in a wreck with a witch. This is cool. And she was actually really, really sweet. So there was really nothing that was bad about that situation, except we just had a wreck. And I really wish that we would have stayed in contact with one another because she really had a great personality to her. So that's my story, and I'm eager to see what yours is. But with that said, it's now time to close out the video, and before I do, I would like to say thank you to Lisa G and Melody Romeo, which Melody Romeo is a historic fiction and fantasy fiction author, and if you would like to check out her books, they're available in print and ebook, which you can get those wherever books are sold. And if you're wondering why I'm giving a shout out to these wonderful people, it's because they have contributed to my Patreon account, and if you would like to contribute as well, well, the link to my Patreon is in the description section of this video. And for $5 a month, I'll give you a shout out at the end of my videos, which if you have a profession you would like for me to tie to that, then I will do that for you. And there's also a second tier that's a $10 tier. And for that amount, you'll get the shout out at the end of my videos, but I will also include one photo per month, which I do creepy photography on the side. And once you receive that photo, you can print it out, do whatever you want with it. But if you are able to do that, that's awesome. If not, no sweat whatsoever. I just hope you return to this channel so we can continue to have fun. And if you would like to hit me up on social media, links to my Facebook, Twitter, Instagram, and TikTok are all in the description section of this video. Also, if you have not subscribed to this channel, be sure to subscribe and hit that notifications bell because I have more great book reviews coming in the near future. So until we see each other again, I hope you have a wonderful week and sweet nightmares.